Wir starten jetzt aber mit der Digitalministerin Audrey Tang ähm, und dafür wechsle ich auch ins Englische, so dass sie uns verstehen kann. I'm so happy to have her here, Mrs. Audrey Tang. And Sie hört mich noch nicht. Okay, ich erzähle es trotzdem, weil die, because this information is so important for everyone else, because you should uh, stay in our live stream. Because since, since I read and heard from her for, for the first time, I'm a huge fan of her work. Really, I'm such a huge fan. And I promise you, you will be one too, if you aren't already. Taiwan is a role model for digital democracy and Audrey helps to build the tools um, to bring and she brings together the government, companies and civil society and I think that's a very important aspect um, to bring together all these parts. She practices radical transparency in her work as a minister and also in the tools she promotes. So open source and open data are um, the default in her digital developments. And after her input, the, spokespersons, sp the spokesperson of the parliamentary group of the Free Democrats for technology, Mario Brandenburg, will have a small chat with her. So please welcome with me um, Mrs. Audrey Tang from Taiwan and you are still able to ask your questions also in German. We will translate them here. Um, so please enjoy her talk and get inspired by her. <coughs> Sie ist noch nicht da. Ja. Sie ist auf dem Weg. Gut. Ja, ich bin auch ganz gespannt. <lacht> Schon mal ähm, ähm, Sie getroffen? Nee, noch nicht. Ich, noch war nicht? Noch, ich war auch noch nicht in Taiwan. Und da ist sie. Da ist das sie. Ist ja, das ist ja Hi, toll. Hi, Audrey. Good to see you again. Very good seeing you. Good luck for time, everyone. <lacht> Hi, so I already introduced you here and told everyone I'm a huge fan since I heard and read from you for the first time. I'm totally fangirling every time and I'm so excited um, to hear your talk and I hope everyone will get a huge fan afterwards too. Excellent. <laughs> so please start. It's your turn, your stage. Okay, good. Um, so, um, because I'm not going to use any slides, uh, I will just occasionally uh, show my iPad like this. So just to make sure the lining works and you can see my screen like this. Excellent. Is it working? Excellent. Can you see, make out the words? <laughs> yeah, it works. Okay. Okay, excellent, excellent. That's great. Right. So, um, hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. I'm here to share first very briefly, like 10 minutes about how we use uh, digital democracy to counter the COVID. Uh, and by digital democracy, we mean democracy that improves as more people participate. And digital technology remains one of the best ways to improve participation, as long as the focus is on finding common ground, that is to say pro-social media, not anti-social media. Um, and we successfully countered the coronavirus in Taiwan. It's been two months with no local cases. We're now officially post-pandemic uh, with no lockdowns. And that's thanks to the power of digital democracy. And so uh, there are three keywords uh, that we usually use. Um, it's very easy to remember uh, the core principles, and that's called fast, fair, and fun. Uh, and so fast uh, <laughs> means that it's a collective intelligence system, whereas many countries have been encountering coronavirus only this year. Taiwan started last year. Last December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, posted that there are seven new SARS cases in Wuhan, uh, he got inquiries, eventually punishments from his local police institution. But at the same time, the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit, which is a not-for-profit built by students, a discussion board called the PTT, has someone reposting Dr. Li Wenliang's whistleblowing, and it's been upvoted to the medical officers, who immediately notice this post and issue an order that says all passengers flying in from Wuhan to Taiwan need to start health inspection the very next day, which is the first day of January. And so this tells me two things. One is that the civil society trusts the government enough to talk about these new parts, possible SARS outbreaks in the public forum without fearing any censorship or anything. 
and that government trusts the citizen enough to take it seriously and treat it as if SARS has happened again, something we've always been preparing since 2003. And so because of this open civil society, according to Civicus Monitor, uh, Taiwan is the only country in the whole of Asia who have the completely open in terms of freedom of speech, of assembly, of the press, and so on, as other Western liberal democratic countries. But we are uh, emphasizing on keeping an open mind to a new ideas from society because our first presidential election was 1996. And so uh, we're a very young democracy, and we think democracy and internet is the same thing. So, for example, every day our Central Epidemic Command Center, or CECC, hosts a press conference, which is always live streamed, went on for 140 days. Uh, they work with the journalist community and answer all the questions from all the journalists, which is always live streamed. And because of this, whenever there is any new idea coming in from the social sector, anyone can pick up their phone and call this very easy to remember number 1922, even from a landline, and tell that idea to the CECC. For example, there was one day in April when a young boy that said, oh, he doesn't want to go to school because we're rationing the mask. And when you ration, you don't get to pick the color and he only have pink medical mask. And his classmate may laugh at him for wearing a pink medical mask. Um, and so the very next day after hearing this from the 1922, everybody from the Central Epidemic uh, Command Center wore pink <laughs> medical mask making sure that everybody learns about gender mainstreaming. And this is also a social innovation. So this kind of rapid response, 24-hour cycle, builds trust between the government and the civil society by having the government trust citizens first, and so the citizens may trust each other more. Another focus is fairness. For example, uh, in Taiwan, we have a lot of government websites, uh, and these all end in .gov.tw, I'm sure it's the same for you. Uh, and uh, what we do in Taiwan is that we have a civic tech movement that change all the websites like join .gov.tw that they don't like into equivalent but open source websites, and they call join .g0v.tw. So you just change a letter into a digit in your um, URL, in your browser bar, you make it digital, so to speak, <laughs> uh, and you get into this shadow government website uh, that is based on civic technology. And so Gov0 and many community contributors this time play a huge role in ensuring fair distribution of PPEs. For example, when we um, ramped up the facial mask production, everybody could use um, their um, national health card to procure uh, the uh, pharmacy's uh, medical mask. And so this is uh, one such map uh, built in the GovZero's uh, Slack channel uh, chat room. And it shows that in this particular pharmacy, there are 58 adult masks in store, uh, 196 uh, children's masks in store. Uh, and this shows the nearby pharmacies that still have uh, these in stock. And the great thing about this is that this is not procurement. This is reverse procurement. This is the Gov0 people building this map, demanding the government, providing the open API needed to make it work, because the initial prototype relied on citizens to self-report. So in uh, more rural areas, there's less uh, people participating in this crowdsourcing. So they demanded that the National Health Insurance Agency provide a real-time API. And the National Health Insurance Agency actually did that because they trust citizens with open data. And when open data gets refreshed every 30 seconds, that become open API. And so that's what enable more than 100 different tools, including for people with blindness, maybe they cannot use map, but they, they can use voice assistance, chatbots, and things like that, can get inclusive access to information about which pharmacies near them still have the mask. So because Taiwan has more than 99.99% of health coverage, people who show any symptom will then be able to take the medical mask, go to a local clinic, knowing for sure that they will get treated fairly without incurring any financial burden, without causing any risk to their community. And this also enables civic technologists to make analysis, to make dashboard that let people see, for example, when we are ramping up the production uh, so that from people uh, getting three masks every week, uh, to uh, nine masks uh, every two weeks. Uh, you can see a spike in the production here. And it also shows uh, whether there's an oversupply or an undersupply in whatever district and things like that. And this is, again, not a government project. People just wrote this by their own using the open API. And we co-created with the real feedback of the pharmacies 
making sure that everybody who think uh, that we distribute it uh, in a not fair fashion can actually uh, code up a better distribution policy. And then we adopted that uh, and have the CECC announce that in the press conference the next day. And so because of that, we ensure fairness of all kinds by seeing that uh, where are the people not getting the masks? Uh, it's peaked at around 70%. Uh, and we discovered the remaining 30% was in municipalities with very long working hours. And so when they go off work, the pharmacies are already closed. And so, of course, they cannot collect the mask that way. And they often live uh, by themselves, not with the family, so they cannot give their family the NHI card. So because of that, we started working with convenience store. You see our premier, Su Jin Chang, smiling very happily here because we started <laughs> at that day working with the convenience stores who are offering a lot of uh, benefits, perks, uh, like free coffee or uh, free water or whatever uh, for people who choose to go to the convenience store to pre-order the mask where they can uh, collect 24 hours a day. So for a country with 23 million people, um, around uh, 21 million people have used uh, this uh, mask collection service, which is a huge success. And the remaining ones, maybe they still uh, already have some mask pre-bought before the pandemic. They even participate on the app to dedicate those masks for international humanitarian aid. Uh, some of their dedicated masks end up uh, in Germany. And so this is not a uh, donation by the Taiwan Foreign Service, but rather by Taiwanese people. You can see all the six 100,000 people, half of which review their name uh, on the website. And so again, this is collective action that ensure fairness of all kinds. And finally, in the fast, fair, fun, um, we would like to stress, but because this is a very stressful time, people feel anxious. There's a lot of conspiracy theories and panic buying that thrives on outrage. If a message have outrage, a rumor have outrage provoked, it will have an R0 value of maybe two or three, meaning that everybody who sees this outrageous message will click share, uh, and it will share to two or three people, uh, making it viral. So how do we counter that without a takedown? Uh, just like we counter pandemic without a lockdown, well, we use the power of humor, uh, humor over rumor. It's called our strategy. So one example, when there was a panic buying of pet tissue papers, there was a rumor that says, is the same material as facial mask because we're ramping up production from 2 million a day to 20 million a day. There was panic buying because people fear that the tissue paper may run out. So it's the same premier, Su Jen Chang, you saw just smiling in a previous slide, now shows his bottom, wiggling it a little bit, uh, and says in very large print that uh, each of us only have one pair of Botox. Uh, and, and this is a, a wordplay because stockpiling and botox is the same sound in Mandarin. Uh, and so meaning that people don't need to, to stockpile uh, and there's no need to panic buy because there's a very clear uh, table that says medical masks are made out of domestic material and the pulp made uh, for tissue papers are made out of South American material. And this went absolutely viral, maybe have an Arnold value of five or something. Uh, and so people who laughed about this is literally unable to feel outrage because these are competing pathways in the mind. Uh, and so the R value of the rumor died down in just two days. And we found out the person who spread the rumor about, about tissue paper was a tissue paper reseller. And so, and this is not just a single shot a point in the social media. Every day, those CECC daily press conference gets translated by the Minister of Health and Welfare spokes dog or Song Chai, the dodgy dog CEO. Uh, it's a uh, dog that looks like this. Um, really, uh, that's the dog who lives with the participation officer, the person in the Ministry of uh, Health and Welfare uh, charge to engage the public. So they just go back home, take photo of the dog, and translate physical distancing rule to say, if you are outdoor, you have to stay two dogs away from each other. If you're indoor, you have to stay uh, three dogs away from each other. And please uh, cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Do not do what this dog uh, does. Uh, and please wear a mask to protect yourself uh, from your own hands. Uh, and use soap to wash your hands. And remember to pre-order your mask so on and so forth. And all of them went very viral. So we make sure that our humor, our factual humor spreads faster than rumor. And that's how we make sure the Taiwanese people still feel calm and collected even during the pandemic. 
And so there's much more, uh, including the full list of people who donated uh, the masks uh, in Taiwan can help that us. And please feel free to read more there. So that's my opening slides. Audrey, and thank you for showing us what I love most at your work. It's your human-centered approach. So you really think about the human in your work and for showing us that innovation doesn't need to be about something digital. It needs to be also about the human and something new and um, what helps the human. So I'm really happy to have uh, the spokesperson for technology of the parliamentary group of the Free Democrats here with me, Mario Brandenburg. Welcome, and uh, we laugh both here <laughs> yep. about everything. So <laughs> it's it's so nice. What do you think about this approach, making people <laughs> laugh, and then uh, they they are not panicking and they are not afraid anymore? Um, I mean, it absolutely works. So first of all, Audrey, thanks so much for uh, sharing some of your precious time with us. And um, as Anne Katrin said, I'm I'm a fan uh, of you uh, by myself, and. <laughs> when you were saying you, you, you're using the methodology fast, fair and fun. So by myself I thought, okay, fair, we are relatively good in Germany. Fun sometimes, but fast, <laughs> I think this is, this is where we struggle. So, um, But then you said something which, which was already wonderful and I would be so happy if you can elaborate a bit more on that. You said um, we just have to trust the citizen first. And since I know you are as well have a total different... Um, how, should, how should I say, vision of um, how politics should be done and how politicians should be. So from in Germany, like the politicians are looking for solutions, then they run a campaign to convince the people. Whereas in Taiwan, basically, the people chat and discuss through your portal, come up with a solution and the politicians only become more like the, the executors of the will Mm -hmm. um, of the people. Mm -hmm. So can, can you share a bit of that idea? Because I think it's unfortunately relatively uncommon here to think <laughs> that way. Um, but I think there's, there's some, some real value and truth to it. So I would be super happy if you share a bit of your ideas with us. Definitely, yes. I'm more of like a poetician uh, than a politician. <laughs> I mostly write uh, humorous uh, limericks uh, and poems, uh, and, and this is where I work. This is literally my office. This is the Social Innovation Lab in the central Taipei. Uh, it's uh, in the midst of a very large park. There is no wall. People who walk their dog, uh, they just pass by my windows, and they can see me work there. Uh, instead of having a, a park, a garden uh, in the administration building, we move the administration office into a park. Um, and because of that, people just have new idea and can chat with me for 40 minutes at a time, uh, bringing with their new toys like these self-driving tricycles. Uh, and they don't know what to do with them. Uh, and so they would say, hey, minister, why don't we do a sandbox experiment, meaning that for a year or so, we will let them roam free uh, in that park and see how the market uh, interact with them. And when I say market, I mean specifically the Jianguo flower market, which runs on weekends and people sell flowers there. Uh, and so um, there are people with some pots of flowers uh, and say, hey, minister, what are you doing with those shopping carts? And I'm like, these are not shopping carts. These are self-driving vehicles. You hop on one, it drives you there. And they're like, we do not want to hop on one because this is too slow, which is true. Uh, and they say, uh, we want it to walk with us. So when we buy flowers, we can put into it. And also we hear on TV that there is something called platooning, that when this is full, it can move back uh, and summon an empty one to join it so that it can, uh, we can do hands-free shopping uh, alongside the entire Jianguo flower market. Now, that is totally unanticipated by the original maker of that team. But because we insist on open innovation, meaning that we invite everybody around, like the Taipei Tech University nearby, they eventually change, modified, uh, so that uh, it doesn't really need those two eyes, by the way, <laughs> if it runs on LiDAR. But these two eyes shows people who they are following. Uh, and that they understand the social norms, uh, like how to uh, yield to people who are elderly or pregnant uh, or things like that. And all of it, uh, so this is me in it. And so uh, all of it ensures that uh, we first build a norm around uh, emergent technology before introducing it to the wider public or on public road. But when we introduce it, for example, right this week, uh, such self-driving buses start running uh, in Taipei City in its 
a dedicated bus lane. And people, because they have already a year or two, getting used to the logic of these self-driving vehicles, there is no panic. And people integrate uh, co-domesticating those different assistive intelligences. So this is not the mayor or the minister have a grand vision. This is just people bringing their toys and opening up for the society to determine whether it's a good idea or not to include it in our daily life. Okay. Wonderful. I think we can learn from that. I'm not quite sure where I could park these things in my <laughs> tiny office I have over here in the parliament. Um, but actually, that's the example I meant. So this is, I think, where we can learn from you. And um, we as Free Democrats, we are fighting very hard to get some sandbox environments because, um, yes, Germany, I mean, um, it's um, a, a growing democracy, but it gets a bit slower here and there. And I think the, having these sandboxes or these environments where people can play around and actually lose their, their scare or whatever, so that's very, very valuable to have yeah. them. Um, and um, yeah, you made me laugh. And as you said, that's probably the point how to convince people, not like in a 20 minute speech or with whatever regulation, just to make it easy, like, like children's learn. You know, you just do it. If it's fun, you go on with it. If not, you just leave it. So. Yeah. And I think, Audrey, you have another very nice approach. And I think it uh, will suit to Mario very well, because he's from Rheinland-Pfalz, where they have very nice food and wine. When you were here last autumn, uh, <laughs> people ask you, how do you get older people to technology, to use your instruments um, for, for online consultation, participation? And you told us something about food. Can you yes, tell us what you do with food, food and, and digitalization? Yes. Food and drink, food and drink. <laughs> so uh, I mentioned that every Wednesday, uh, people can walk in the park right, and talk to me for 40 minutes. Uh, and uh, everything that we say must be published either as video or as transcript online. There's no exceptions. So because of that, the lobbyists who come to me, uh, they always make argument based on the global goals uh, because, well, they know that everything they say will be published online. And so this makes sure that people add to each other's argument instead of distract from each other's argument. But this also creates a burden for the elderly for whom it's harder to travel to Taipei. So every other Tuesday or so, I visit them in their vicinity. So I make a round trip tour toward Tai, uh, in the entirety of Taiwan and also on remote islands. Um, and these are the elderly people uh, running co-ops or social enterprises or the MPOs and so on locally. So for them, this is just another town hall meeting. And on Monday night, I usually visit and stay for a night or so uh, to do an ethnographic uh, hanging out uh, with them, enjoy food uh, together. And if uh, I need a cultural translator, there's also indigenous uh, cultural translators teaching me how to pronounce, uh, for example, the highest mountain in Taiwan uh, called Yushan or Jade Mountain. But in the local language, it would be Saviya or uh, Padugunung uh, or some <laughs> other uh, indigenous language name. Uh, but when I travel, I travel by myself, but I connect back to Taipei, to Social Innovation Lab, where more than 12 ministries, section chief or higher, are seeing through this projected wall what I see in that locality. So in a sense, I bring the central government with me every time I travel. And I make sure that people across different municipalities and the locality where the town hall happens enjoy uh, at least the same music but also sometimes the same kind of food so that we can build a rapport. And the elderly, they have better recipe. So they uh, <laughs> will be much more uh, able to join because they know that they will contribute more to the atmosphere of the discussion. And everything uh, that they answer will be part of the socialinnovation.taiwan.gov.tw uh, website, which ensure a responsive, inclusive, and also representational decision making, even for the uh, very old and the very young. Even though the, the very young have no voting rights, uh, they can still participate in such town halls safely uh, within their locality because it's we with technology visit them, bring technology to them instead of asking them to come to technology. Mm. 
Mario, do you think this is a nice social innovation approach for Germany to bring together people for having food and talk about new ideas? Would you do this? I mean, you're talking to the right person here, <laughs> sir, absolutely. Um, I'm in, I would bring some wine. No, but again, this is, this is um, <laughs> you know me. So, but th that's, that's um, it's part of the same story. You go there, you let them experience, you play, and actually, yes, you are there. So, I mean, we have the discussion in Germany as well. It's like, look what they in Berlin do. Oh, that's a solution for Berlin. I, by myself, live on the countryside, so I'm not a city guy. I don't want to live in a big city. And when I had discussions here in Berlin about where to park my e-scooter, like back home, I, I don't know, I need to whatever, drive one hour with a car to actually find an e-scooter <laughs> somewhere. So these people find a bit of, how should I say, detached to the actual discussion. And so that's very valuable. And, and I know this is as well, um, you, you told me that story, how you basically um, created the fake spotting community as well. You know, that they sat together and had some nice uh, food and wine. And, and then it's now like a sport um, to, to basically debunk the silliest fake. And if you think about that in a German way, we are thinking, or not we as liberals, but um, it was just discussed previously about NetsDG, upload filters and all that, that stuff, which is a technical solution to a human cost problem. Mm -hmm. So, but what happens if I say something, which I personally think it's right, but it's wrong and it just disappears. Mm -hmm. So where's the learning effect? So it's just not possible. And then basically you get to where we are right now. Um, as we said, the people with the alu heads, like, you know, people don't believe the big story anymore. And I think it's relatively easy to solve that if you come up with such approaches, because it's definitely not easy if you sit like across and somebody talks to you like a real person and that thing goes away. And then I would say like, like Audrey already shows, um, the good message is spreading and not the bad one. Like I was left mm -hmm. alone or even they use technology uh, to make me voiceless because then basically we, we get a lot of collateral damage. And this is the danger when you play with such um, censorship mm -hmm. laws. I have now mm -hmm. um, two announcements uh, in the middle. First of all, the most important, um, my team in the uh, backstage told me the chat is absolutely amazed from you, Audrey. And you are very welcome, the audience out there, to ask questions uh, to Taiwan's digital minister. Frag die Fragen auch gerne auf Deutsch. Ich kann sie hier übersetzen. And then there is a second announcement. Um, I do it first of you for you, Audrey, in English. Um, in five minutes, there will be a huge alarm here because we're in the parliamentary building and the parliamentarians have to go to vote. So it's no fire alarm. You don't need to be scared for us. Everything will be uh, okay. Nochmal auf Deutsch. In fünf Minuten gibt es hier gleich einen lauten Piepton, weil wir im parlamentarischen Gebäude sind. Das, der ruft die Parlamentarierinnen zum, ähm, zum ähm, Abstimmen auf. Es gibt eine namentliche Abstimmung. Keine Sorge, es ist kein Feueralarm. Äh, wir machen aber währenddessen einfach weiter. Um, so, we talked about the humor. And I think, Audrey, you have also a big problem uh, with disinformation and fake news. So not only like during the coronavirus. What's that? Oh, my God. The alu hat. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you have them as well. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and I think your approach is so nice to work against uh, disinformation with humor. So you're not doing this uh, only since, since the corona crisis, but also before. So um, can you tell us a bit more about your approach? Because maybe this is also not so typical German mm -hmm. humor. We try to. We try to. So we, sometimes it we works are very out. good examples. Somebody needs to write a paper. And <laughs> <laughs> um, how how yeah. does humor yeah. help to, to yeah. uh, against disinformation? So, so so this is very relevant because <laughs> I'm translating for you uh, the Mandarin here. This says, "I'm now wearing my aluminum hat. There's no way Audrey Tang can detect me." <laughs> uh, and I replied, I replied in a matter of minutes, saying that. Aluminum hats only amplify electromagnetic signals. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a real MIT study, by the way. <laughs> a aluminum hat actually amplifies certain bands of signals, and those are the bands you use for telecommunication for your cell phone. That's why you, when you have a weak Wi-Fi, you can use aluminum can to serve as a kind of makeshift antenna. Uh, and so sharing scientific knowledge in a funny way really is the solution of making um, those uh, alu hats uh, enjoy a sense of uh, fun. And once they feel fun, they're again, as I said, there is not coexisting with outrage. 
And so we have a team of uh, including comedians, but also policy, uh, policy experts and so on in each ministry that uh, for every trending rumor, they have to respond in two hours under 200 characters in two pictures. On average, they make a meme uh, with about 60 minutes after each trending rumor. It's <laughs> tons of work. Uh, and so I would just use one example before the pandemic. There was one rumor that says here, uh, perming your hair uh, with multiple times in a week will result in a $1 million fine. Okay. And that's outrageous. So it's <laughs> spreading. And not, uh, not even one hour later, uh, there was a picture posted by our premier, Su Zhen Chang. This is how he looks like when he was young. Uh, and he says, even I am bald now, I would not punish people who look like my youth. Uh, and a small print that says, what we have done is a labeling requirement that starts 2021 for the makers of hair products. <laughs> and the mimetic payload here with a hair blower uh, is the uh, Su Zhen Chang as he looks now. Uh, and he says, however, perming your hair many times a week will not damage your pocket but it will damage your hair. Look <laughs> at me, at what may happen to you. Um, and so this is very funny. Uh, and, and again, he make himself quite literally the butt of the joke in the previous one. And the head of the joke, I guess, were this one. Uh, and so he offends nobody. And because of this, when you Google for Permi hair fine in Taiwan, you will see this picture. You will never see the original rumor again. And because of that, we make sure that humor over rumor is fast enough to counter each and every social outrage. And for the few ones that we cannot make fun of, for example, on plastic straws choking the sea turtles, we did not figure out a way to make it fun. It's not a funny thing. Uh, we just invited the petitioners to co-create our plastic straw banning policy uh, together. And people who complain about tax filing being explosively hostile. Again, we cannot make fun of tax filing. Uh, that's very difficult to make fun of tax <laughs> filing. Uh, and so we just invited the people who complain into co-creator and we together designed a new tax filing system, um, which uh, as of a year ago had more than 93% approval rating, which is unheard of in digital technologies that were rolled out by government, exactly because thousands of very angry people turned their angry energy into creative energy. So either humor or creative energy is the best outlet for outrage. That's so amazing and so important. And you use a lot of um, creative energy from the people in Taiwan. So uh, here during the Corona crisis, our government, they um, hosted the first uh, hackathon, so We Against Virus. But um, it, it was new for Germany, but it's not new for Taiwan, right? No, it's not. Uh, we do presidential <laughs> of course not. every year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, actually today is the workshop day of presidential hackathon. I am in Linko in Startup Terrace. The president was just here this morning uh, and listened to all the 24 teams doing their pitch uh, for the idea that may change Taiwan using technology for good. Uh, and for the next couple months, we will coach the top 24 teams, which was voted in by the people using a new voting method called quadratic voting or QV, but I don't have time to go there. Uh, but in the any case, the idea is that the president herself listened to every pitch. And once uh, we announce the top five winners, she give out the award personally to the five winners. And the award, which is very interesting, is shaped like Taiwan. Uh, this year is made out of glass. Uh, and we uh, recycled at that. Uh, and um, you can see this trophy, uh, which uh, always correspond to the SDG. Each team need to choose the SDGs they correspond with, um, have a micro projector underneath. When you turn on the micro projector, uh, this trophy will project Dr. Tsai Ing-wen giving you the trophy. So it's a self-describing trophy uh, that carries no money, but it carries the presidential promise whatever you did in the past three months, we will make it national policy with the regulation and budget changes needed in the 12 months. And we deliver on all of it. And so in the past two years, uh, it's been a steady growth in presidential hackathon 
teams. And this year is a record number. Uh, I think it's more than 200 teams and with a lot of people, more than 10,000 people participating in the quadratic voting round. Mm. The SDGs are the uh, Sustainable Development Goals by the Uni United yes. Nations, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, there was one interesting point. I mean, you said the doing a hackathon was new for us. So I know, Audrey, it must be for you like talking uh, to the past, like, <laughs> like we are the Flintstones, but <laughs> to us, it was a big innovation uh, doing a hackathon. So, and the, the, the good thing was like 40,000 um, people joined, joined the Slack channel, com came up with ideas. But then actually we failed because afterwards nothing happened so this is why um, i was listening to the trophy because you know you can ask people for help and then they join but then if there is no process afterwards that's a danger i mean it can happen one time you know it's trial and error it's the first time and these people joining had the custom know this but you cannot call them all the time say you give me your ideas and then nothing happens so like with this trophy that's that's a super solution because it's not always about the money our virus was we against the vi uh, our hackathon was we against the virus, so people doing it for good anyway. But there needs to be some commitment, some commitment, or at least some thank you in a longer way. And this is actually the difference if you do something really by heart, like mm. with with your fullest, um, how should I say, with your fullest commitment that this is right, or if you try it out like we do. And this is something I really, really often miss in German politics. You know, there is good ideas, yes then somebody is using them. So in terms that they exist, like I worked in sales and then you have a RFI, so like a checklist or oh, yeah, the product can do this and this and that. But then if you really ask, yeah, how does, how is this point? Oh, mm, yeah, you know, it's, you know, it's all decoration like a Western city where there's nothing behind the house. And that's a bit of a problem here. We try to copy these good ideas, but then we stop. Um, and this is something which has to change because then people might not join anymore if you go this way. Mario, do you think there's a lack of trust by the government in the civic society and civic ideas? Um, I would say it's both ways, I guess. So, <laughs> so but, but both sides worked on it. So mm -hmm. um, if I come up with ideas like, and there was a chat in the uh, question in the chat, like the Staatstrojana and stuff, so like spying on my people. So if, some, if I read about that, so it's not naturally that I say, oh, that's a good, that seems like a good idea. These people spy at me, I should give them more data. So, you know, it's a give and take. Uh, but somebody needs to basically start to rewind that circle or, mm -hmm. or think it the other way around because I guess when you started, Audrey, I mean, as, as well now, there is opposition through that. But I, I guess, and that would be my question, can you see and feel that the people interested in politics or following your approach getting more and more? Like, is it possible to somehow, you know, reverse that spiral and have it the other way around, turning into the positive, open-minded direction? Yes, I think open innovation by definition uh, thrives uh, when the R value is higher than one, right? <laughs> when it's replicable, when it can go viral uh, and ideas worth spreading. Uh, I'm not talking about TED, uh, but including TED uh, are the things that uh, the social innovations, why it serves a global value is so important. And so if you want that trophy I just described, you can get it in Germany, actually. Um, our presidential hackathon, the international track, is still open for admission <laughs> for five more days. Got to leave. So, <laughs> Got to leave. For, for presidential hackathon Taiwan uh, and identify the SDGs you are working on, you can get that trophy. Even if you may not be able to travel physically in September, we will FedEx uh, in any way send <laughs> the trophy to you uh, with the micro projector. And when next year uh, the travel resumes, uh, we can still give you the plane ticket uh, to enjoy sharing of food and, and drink uh, with the new year's, uh, not next year's champions in a presidential hackathon. So uh, everything is still guaranteed. We just delay it by one year for the physical <laughs> traveling and sharing part. And, and that's how the ideas spread because um, we may develop something that works very well for contact tracing in Taiwan. It's a, um, one of the hackathon winners they develop an app that doesn't send anything anywhere. It works in airplane mode. Um, and then when the contact tracer comes to the person, that app generates a one-time link that 
uh, has the minimum information necessary for contact tracing to work. And so it's built as something that protects the user because in a traditional interview, they will reveal private information about their friend and family. They don't want to do that. So it's an app that strictly works in your best interest and your family's best interest because it will protect your privacy. Now we have that as a hackathon winner. Uh, it's not useful in Taiwan because we're post pandemic, uh, <laughs> but we are working with like-minded country to see whether that idea can fly in other jurisdictions as well. In I think in UK, they're already in the talks. Yeah. This is a very important information for me from you because you said data privacy or privacy at all is also very important in Taiwan because everyone here in Germany uh, screams that we are too protective regarding data and that nothing will work. But right now we, we just um, launched our uh, Corona tracing app a few days ago, which is um, open source, which I really like. We, we lobbied for it and which protects the, the, the privacy of every user. So. Um, you also are focusing on, on this issue in Taiwan. So you're not like, we can use all the data. So privacy is also important with you, right? Of course, it's very important. And the incentive design is very important as well. We wear the mask to signal to the society that I'm protecting myself from my own hand, mm -hmm. that I'm washing my hands thoroughly. And we can see that in water usage data across urban and rural areas. People are washing their hands much more thoroughly, but it's privacy enhancing because we don't know who is washing their hands. But in any case, uh, it says that use soap more, use uh, hand sprays uh, more, and protect your own mouth from your own hand as the dog just showed you. And this kind of idea, because it serves primarily the person who wear the mask, travel much faster than if you say, we wear this to respect others or other kind of incentive design. Uh, so would you agree that, that innovation and, and data protection and combination is possible, yes? Yes, of course, and it needs to serve the best interest mm -hmm. of the person. It, the person needs to know that if I'm wearing this glass, it mostly assists my eyesight and not uh, flash out an advertisement or something <laughs> uh, whenever I look at some QR code. Yeah. <laughs> Mario, do you think uh, that could be um, a, a role model, how the Corona Tracing app now developed here in Germany so that the government really listened to um, civil society and made it an open source project and, and listened to the demands for data privacy? I mean, I hope so. It took some time, so they went some uh, wrong steps, came up with wrong ideas, but in the end, we could convince them. So I hope, oh, there is the, <laughs> please go to the vote uh, alarm. So um, I hope that they learn something from it. But in general, it's normally not their strengths to listen to. Um, I'll just go on talking. I hope that you can hear me. Um, because it's a different model of thinking or, or of understanding how to do it. And I know that, um, Audrey, you once talked about um, robot rights, like uh, that everything has to be machine readable so that a chatbot basically or a bot can read it to learn. So I just want to tell you how the discussion over here is. If you say to something, what is a chatbot? I guess 50% doesn't know and the other half is scared. So because they say, oh, these are the things which uh, make democracy go down. And so that's the total different thinking. If, if this is your, um, your vision of a chatbot, why would you give it more information? Why would you share? So we're having the discussion totally from a different, wrongly, um, wrongly focused mindset. And this is why it is so hard for us to understand that. And you could see that with our government. When we were talking about the app, our minister said that's perfect. I just asked um, the data providers like the, the telecom to give them uh, to give us your GPS data. So I mean, that's technically nonsense. We know that, especially if you live on the countryside. So GPS, that's <laughs> nice. So the whole street is still, you yeah. know, so that's like technically bullshit. It's from a personal, um, it's, it's based from a data pr privacy and protection uh, mindset. It's a catastrophic approach. And then we had a discussion about central, decentral, but it's good that we had that in the end, but it would be better and more convincing if somebody would have stepped out like Audrey said, look, we have to do that. And this and this are the reasons. Here's the feedback channel. This is what we plan. It's transparent. What do you think? And then we would have saved probably one month and a couple of millions because our app was not built by community. <laughs> it was rather built by two big companies, which is not a problem at all, but we could have had it cheaper and faster probably. Yeah. 
Um, we have three minutes left, and Audrey, maybe you can give us some some um, key points on digital democracy because most people think when they hear the term digital re democracy on online voting or digital voting, but it's not only that; it's far more than that, right? Right. So uh, I will share uh, one simple picture. I think uh, one of the most important picture uh, in my whole slide, and this is the picture of people who share their ideas when UberX first entered Taiwan with no professional driver's license in 2015. It's a very divisive issue. But using the system called POLIS, everybody see each other's feelings. For example, this is my feeling. I feel that liability insurance for passenger is very important. Now, you can both agree with my idea, in which case your avatar moved closer to me. Or you can disagree where you move farther away from me. But you can see all your friends and family here. So they are all your friends. They are not some nameless trolls. It's just you did not <laughs> talk about Uber over dinner. Uh, and so because of that, people can see that we're still a polity. And after three weeks of discussion, we always, every single time, get this picture. We use it for the coronavirus uh, hackathon to develop the kind of uh, privacy enhancing app uh, that I just described, where people disagree on a few things, very few things. But these things are what capture the attention of social media and sometimes institutional media. But people agree actually on most of the things most of the time, on most of the topics with most of their neighbors. And this could be as simple as uh, the arts are important in STEM education. Uh, instead of science, technology, engineering, and math, we should put art into it. Now, that's actually the wide most consensus when we tried this technology in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And no newspaper <laughs> will run that in the headline. But it turns out whether you identify at that time as a Democrat or a Republican, that's what everybody agrees on. So if the mayor implements it and it costs nothing, uh, everybody loves them more, right? So the idea is that uh, democracy is not about a showdown between opposing values only. It is also about conversation with the plural uh, values. And I will read my job description very quickly because it shows how different if you start with a technological IT only view on things and a digital, a pluralistic view on things and it goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. Mm. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. Yeah. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. And that's my job description. Thank you so much, Audrey. And I wanted to ask you if you can share us your, your, you call it your prayer ride with us because I like it so much. And um, if you don't mind, and if you have still some time, uh, I would love to go on with the chat with you because our next guest uh, is missing because of the uh, parliamentary voting. So do you have some time still? I have uh, another 30 minutes. Another 30 minutes, great. Because... Um, I have another question, or do you have a question? No, no I, ha I, have, I have plenty of questions. Go um, on, because, because <laughs> I lost mine. I lost mine, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, first of all, uh, listen, listen to what basically you just told. Is somehow it's always enlightening, and I feel motivated, but then somehow I feel <laughs> depressed how, how far uh, we have to go. Um, and with, with the tools you just showed, um, how many percent, um, basically, of your people are you reaching? Can you see that it is growing? And I, I would yes, yeah. be very interested Definitely. in, like, super mm -hmm. controversial topics, for example, like CRISPR. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. how is it, like, we don't have these tools, obviously, you know that. But, but how, how deep or, or how, how soft is such a discussion on, on such a sensitive topic if you just mm -hmm. ask them? And I know that um, to you it's very important how the question is formulated, not do you want to have this? So can you just explain us what's your, your idea behind that here? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and this is a really good question. So uh, the total user of the national participation platform 
joined the GOV.TW uh, as of last year uh, have exceeded 10 million, uh, which is 10 million is a large number because we're just 23 million people. And of this year, I think it will pass majority, which is why we dropped the E from the E participation platform. It's not just a participation platform uh, because you don't say, uh, let's uh, e message you, email <laughs> you, right? I'll message you, I'll mail you. And that's kind of uh, taken for granted. And uh, uh, shaping is very important. We even use it for international dialogue, like working with the US uh, de facto embassy in Taiwan, the AIT, on uh, how to promote, uh, for example, closer people to people uh, relationships. And this is important because uh, there are very some controversial idea, like Taiwan should make English the working language. Uh, even the French have done that. And exactly one half is pro that, one half is against that. And everybody will be very angry if we only focus on such one divisive statement. But because of POLIS, uh, there is no reply button. With no reply button, there is no room for troll to grow. And so the top consensus become Taiwan need to move quickly toward becoming a bilingual nation, which you will see it's exactly the same idea, just with a longer time span. <laughs> and so that is the kind of dialogue that this framing ensure because it's like a wiki. Uh, instead of predefined survey, everybody can make a more nuanced, more eclectic idea. And I see actually Andreas and Jacob, our next speaker, uh, have come on stage. So maybe that's the last question we take. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Audrey, for um for spending this time, your time with us, and I bet um, the the fan base for, for you is uh, growed a lot here in Germany. So I think we will found a, a club. That's what we Germans do. And um, yeah, thank you again for your time, and have a nice evening. Okay. I think in Taiwan, yes. and see you soon. Yes. Thanks so much. Yeah, live bye long, bye. live long, prosper. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Thank bye you. Bye.